Okay, looks like we've got a good audience, so we may as well get started. Uh, thanks for coming to this session, which is on mastering Cocoa memory management. Uh, my name's Robert Stainsby. I lecture the iPhone software engineering course at RMIT University here in Melbourne. And I've also been mucking around with Cocoa on the Mac and iOS for two more years than I care to remember now. Um, so just to give you an idea of what the talk's about, memory management. So it's talking about in Cocoa environments where we don't have automatic garbage collection, how do we manage our memory to make sure we avoid things like leaking memory and uh, accessing memory when we shouldn't that doesn't contain any valid contents. <coughs> so the scope is um, we're talking about Cocoa Touch on iOS where there's no option but to use memory managed code um, and also a lot of Mac OS X programming as well. So in Mac OS X 10.5 Leopard, um, the option to use garbage collection was introduced in Cocoa, um, but before that it wasn't available. And in practice you'll find, I think probably, it's true to say most Mac code, or certainly a lot of Mac code, still doesn't use automatic garbage collection. It still uses the techniques we'll be talking about today. Um, for various reasons, partly out of habit, um, people want their code backward compatible, Xcode by default, doesn't turn on garbage collection for, um, for new projects. Uh, and of course a big reason is with the success of iOS, people want their code to be uh, compatible across the platforms. Um, now I've said there that, uh, that these techniques apply to pre-leopard code, so Tiger and below, 10.4 and below. Um, I will talk about a few features that were brought in as part of what's called Objective-C 2.0, uh, things like properties that make uh, memory management a bit easier. Um, those are also um, Leopard and Up only or iOS only. Um, while we're on the scope, um, I've called this Mastering Memory Management. Um, it's not aimed to be an expert session, it's aimed to be making sure you get the basics right. So you have an understanding of this, so it's something that you don't go panicking about all the time, have I done it right, and then you can get on and write the code you really want to write. That's, that's sort of what I'm pitching this at. Okay, and um, it's a fairly full session, so if you've got quick questions, Try them in during the talk or otherwise save them up to the end, I think. Okay? All right, so this is just an overview of what I want to cover. So I want to start off by going through in a bit more detail what are the, what are the issues we're trying to deal with here? What are, what are we actually looking at? Then I'll introduce the concept of object ownership, which is the main concept we use to mem manage memory, and have a look at how that applies throughout the object life cycle and the methods that are involved in managing the life cycle of an object. We'll then go, talk about, uh, go on and talk about accessor methods, getters and setters, and properties, which as we'll see are really central to doing memory management well. And we'll just finish up by trying to give you a fairly short list of things, you know, good practice, the way you should do things, and uh, also a few pointers that you're doing things wrong, um, so you can spot those in code that you might write or that other people write. Um, I've got some links here, uh, they're more for when you're reviewing these slides later. Um, so these are hyperlinks if you get the PDF version of the slides or uh, you, can Google, you can search for them in Apple's documentation. Apple's got these nice documents called core competencies um, which are sort of you know, one page, fairly readable, often with pictures, uh, summaries of topics. So they're a great place to get into the documentation when you're trying to get to grips with a concept the first time. And there's also um, more detailed documentation if you want a nice long read and really want to get to grips with all the details. Okay, so let's try and understand what's the issue with memory management. And I'm assuming everyone's seen or, or written some Objective-C before. So let's say that we're writing an Objective-C class that's a model object to serve for, you know, to model something like a conference. And this is what the header file might look like. Is this sort of familiar to everyone here? Everyone seen something like this before, written things like this? So okay, so we're declaring a header for a conference class here. We've got a line that says add interface conference colon NS object, so that's saying it's a subclass of NS object, inheriting from NS object. And then within a pair of curly braces, we've got, we're declaring a couple of instance variables. So you'll see this term IVAR a lot in Cocoa literature. IVAR is just short for instance variable. So this is the data that's held by individual instances of this class. So we've got two instance variables. We've got an integer, so it's a scalar type which is the attendee count, number of attendees at the conference. And then we've got uh, another instance variable which points to 
another Coco object. So it's an NS string pointer with the star there. That's the conference name. So if we have a look at uh, an instance of that class in memory, it might look something like this. So we'll see that when we create one of these things in memory, we've got memory there for our attendee count. And so we can actually store a value in there. So we don't need to worry about creating any extra storage for that integer. But for the conference name, we don't have any storage for the actual string in there. All we've got is storage for a pointer to an NS string object. And we actually need to create a separate object to contain that value of the string. So we'll do something like this. Create a string in memory and set that pointer to point to it. OK? So the issue then becomes how do we manage and make sure that that string stays in memory precisely as long as we want it to? Things that can go wrong. Um, so we said memory leaks are one of the things that can go wrong. So a memory leak would be if um, we got rid of our conference object, but the string stayed around in memory with no one knowing about it. It's using up memory. It's not available to be used for anything else, wasting memory, and yet we have no way of, of getting rid of it. And the other thing that can go wrong is a bad memory access. So we might be starting off with a nice situation. We've got our pointer set up there. But for some reason, the string disappears from memory. And so we're left with a pointer pointing to some memory that contains who knows what. It might contain another string. It might contain another object. It might just contain garbage. So when we go to use the string, we find it's not there. Uh, we might find that we're corrupting some other data. Our application might crash or whatever. So these are the problems we're trying to avoid. The other thing that can happen is um, that, that complicates things a bit is that objects like this string might have more than one other object that's interested in them. So we might, for instance, have um, a label in our user interface that also cares about the string and wants to display its value. And so we want to make sure that we don't just, that that uh, string stays around as long as it's needed by both those other objects that are interested in it. Is that all making sense? Good? Okay. So that's the problem. Here's the solution that we use, object ownership. So we say an object can declare ownership of another object. So in this case, our conference can become the owner of that string. And we make a distinction between owning an object and just having a pointer to it um, for reasons that we'll touch on later on. So it's not enough just to have a pointer to an object in order to own it. You need to, to um, take a, a separate step to own it. And along with declaring ownership, so taking ownership of an object, you can also renounce ownership of objects. And essentially, these are the steps we take to, to manage the memory. And then the rule that's used to delete things is the system will get rid of objects that have no owners. So the system takes care of things they, they got rid of when they have no owners, and that's the only time they got rid of. So going back to our diagram, um, we have our conference with its reference to the string. We also want to mark that string as owned so that the system knows not to delete it. Okay. And if we have our label there as well, that's also interested in the string, we'll get it also to mark the, the string as owned. So it's marked as owned twice. So, better show that. <laughs> OK. Um, just to give a bit of motivation for why we might want to keep the concepts of pointers and uh, ownership separate, um, you want to avoid situations like this because it, with the rules that we're following saying that no owners means you get deleted and that's the only way you get deleted, if you had ownership and pointers being the same thing you could end up with situations like this where you have what's called a retained cycle or a cycle of ownership. Um, so neither object ever gets to the state where it has no owners um, because the other object's always there pointing to it. You could argue um, garbage collect automatic garbage collection is essentially trying to make ownership and point of the same thing. Um, but this is, remember, is a manual environment where we don't have that. So we can do, with having separate concepts of ownership and pointers, we can, get it, we can do things like this. Two objects with a reference to each other, but only one of them has marked itself as the owner of the other. OK? So OK, um, we said objects can claim ownership of other objects. 
And there are just two ways of doing that. One way is to um, create the object. So this means to allocate memory for the object. And there are exactly three keywords that you'll see in Objective-C methods that tell you that the method is allocating memory. So there's alloc, new, and copy. Get to know those words well. Um, these are all methods. Um, the plus sign, as you probably know, indicates a class method. So it's a method that you send, a message that you send to an Objective-C class. Uh, the minus sign indicates it's an instance method that goes to an instance of a class. So you can ask a class, you can send it the alloc message saying allocate memory for that, for an instance of that class. Uh, new we'll talk about in a moment, does a similar thing. Um, and copy is a message you'd send to an existing object to make a new copy of it and allocate memory for that new copy. Um, there are variations of these methods as well that also allocate memory and give you ownership of an object. Things like alloc with zone colon, uh, mutable copy. So remember those keywords, but also watch out for variations of them as well in your method names. So the other way you can own an object is by retaining it. And that's simple enough. You just send the object a retain message. So that's the other way of owning an object. Those are the ways of owning an object. There's also two ways to renounce ownership. So that's uh, release or auto-release. So remember all those keywords. And really, all of memory management, all of this talk, boils down to one simple rule, which is this one. If you own an object, and only if you own an object, you are responsible for releasing it at some stage. OK, so that's everything you need to know about memory management. Let's all leave now. Um, so we can frame that. That's, that's important, OK? Keep that in mind all the time. You won't go wrong. Now, we can, if we do get it wrong, uh, we can map that back to the problems we spoke about earlier on. So if we fail to release an object that we own, we're inviting memory leaks. If we release objects that we don't own, or release an object too many times, that's when you get these bad access errors where the other object goes away before um, when you still want to use it. OK? So we said there are two ways of owning an object. Um, Here's some ways not to own an object. So you don't own objects if you get them, for instance, from a getter method. So with our conference um, class, we had a, a conference name instance variable. And as we'll get onto in a moment, we'll define getters and setters for that variable. So if you call a getter method that's always named after the instance variable, like conference name here, that returns an object that, unless you do something else, you do not own. Okay. Another common way of getting objects is what are called uh, convenience constructors. So these are things like um, sending an array message to the NS mutable array class. You might do this to set up um, an array that you can work with and change during the life of an object. Again, unless you do something else, you don't own that because the method name doesn't contain alloc, copy, new, or retain. Okay? So again, Remember that list of, of names that create ownership. And if it doesn't come from one of those four method names at the bottom there, don't release it. Okay? So now we'll move on to looking at uh, the life cycle of an object. So we start off creating an object. And this is sort of the, the standard textbook way of creating an Objective-C object. Uh, you get the class, you send it the alloc message, and then you send the result of that, the init method message. So alloc is allocating a bit of memory for you to use and claiming ownership of that memory. Init is setting the initial state of that memory. And by default, what it's doing is filling that memory with zeros. So any class pointers in there are taking the nil value. They don't point to any, any object. Um, there's also the new method that we mentioned, and you need to know about new from a memory management point of view. But in your own code, uh, don't use new. This is the standard way experienced Cocoa programmers, the Cocoa community, create objects, splitting it up into the two steps of alloc and new. Sorry, alloc and init. New is equivalent to that combination, but uh, it's not, it doesn't tend to be used. Okay? 
And the, one of the reasons that new doesn't get used much is because by splitting it up into these two steps of alloc and init, uh, you get to make variations more easily. And a variant you often make is um, creating custom init methods. So for instance, um, we said that init by itself will just set all the, uh, the variables in the class to zeros. Um, but we might want to say when we create one of these conference objects, we want to set its name at that time. So we might define a variant of init which is init with name colon um, that takes a value, a string value, that we want to use as the conference's name. Now there's a standard pattern for these uh, init methods that you can see that involves self equals super init and all this sort of stuff. This talk isn't about how to write init methods, um, so I'm not going to go into all those details now, although if you want to ask questions, feel free at the end. Um, but the, the key thing to note in there is the bit that's highlighted in orange, which is that when we set the instance variable conference name equal to the new conference name value that's been passed in, we're retaining that new value. So we're claiming ownership of that value when it's passed in so that we hang on to it for the life of our object. That's where we're claiming that ownership. Um, the other thing you commonly do in uh, a customised init method is you might do something like that alloc that we did with the, or you might create a mutable array or something like that, so some storage that we're going to use through the life of the object. And you might use the alloc method to make sure that you own that as well. Or if you use one of the convenience constructors like the array method we saw earlier, you might send the result a retain message to make sure you hang on to it. Okay, so alloc is one way of claiming ownership. Don't forget that there's also the copy methods as ways of bringing an object into existence and um, claiming ownership of it. And we said that there's the mutable copy um, variation of that. Okay, so that's the birth of an object. We'll go now to the death of an object. The dealloc method. So this is a method that gets run when the system is freeing up the memory that it belongs to an object. So in other words, when the last owner's been removed from the object, the system will call the dealloc method. And so your responsibility if you're implementing a class, writing the code for a class, is to make sure that you override dealloc so that it releases any objects that you owned. And one important thing about dealloc is the system is going to call it your not. So you don't call this in your own code. You write it, um, with one exception that we'll see in a moment, you don't ever call it. So here's an example now of a dealloc method for our conference class. Um, so the key thing there is that line that's highlighted in orange, which is that we're releasing the conference name instance variable. Earlier on we've retained it or um, allocked it, so we've claimed ownership. When, we're getting, when this object's disappearing, we want to make sure we also renounce our ownership of that variable, so we release it. Um, the last line of that is the one exception to when we call dealloc in our own code. So we're calling the superclasses version of dealloc, and that's making sure that the superclasses memory is getting cleaned up as well. If we left that out, we'd have all this memory that the superclass was using that would still be wasted. Um, I've also put a middle line into that method, conference name equals nil. So I'm setting the instance variable equal to nil immediately after releasing it. Um, some people would say you shouldn't do that. Others would say it's a waste of time to do that. Um, there's another argument that says that whenever you release uh, an object, you should immediately set the pointer equal to nil. Um, the reason being that if you, do act, if you do use it again, then you're sending a message to nil, and in objective C, messaging nil doesn't create an error. It just does nothing, and your app can keep running. Some people say that's the problem with it. You want your app to crash uh, if you send a message to something you shouldn't, but there's arguments either way. Uh, for me, the deciding factor is that in one of the early implementations of UI View Controller, one of the classes on iOS, um, Apple was actually telling you to do this in your dialog because things wouldn't work properly if you didn't. So I figure it's safest to just get into the habit of always setting to nil after you release something. But that, that bit's optional. While we're talking about sending messages to nil, it's also worth just thinking through a bit what would happen if we had never stored a value for our conference name and then this uh, dialog method's getting called. So what's effectively happening is um, for conference name there we've got the value nil, okay? So remember sending a message to nil 
in Objective-C is not a problem. Doesn't do anything bad, doesn't, doesn't create any exceptions or anything. So that works fine, it um, doesn't, doesn't cause any problems, and our dialect method just executes fine. So we don't need to test whether it's nil or anything like that, we can just uh, go ahead and use that code. All making sense so far? Yep, good. All right, um, so now I want to get on to accessor methods and uh, properties. So accessors are also known as getters and setters. So getters and setters, of course, are these methods that you provide in an object-oriented environment to preserve encapsulation. Um, so rather than allowing other objects to mess with the data you're holding um, directly, you provide methods that they have to go through, which are the getters and setters. So this is in encapsulation. And as we're going to see, these accessor methods are also really the key to doing memory management easily and, and doing it well. So our getter methods have a standard naming convention. We just name them after the instance variables that they're accessing, and they return the type of the instance variable. And the setters, we just add the word set to the start of the instance variable name, uh, and they take an argument which is the new value of the instance variable. So generally speaking, you'd declare these things in your .h file, your header file for your class, and uh, you'd provide an implementation of them in your .m implementation file. Okay, so those are the declarations which would be in the header file. Let's have a look what we do in the, the .m implementation. So if we've got a scalar quantity, a scalar instance variable like the attendee count, um, and we want to get it for it, it's very simple. We just return the value of the instance variable. No, no magic there. And for a scalar, a setter is just as simple. All you need to do is take the new value that's passed in and assign it to the instance variable. Really basic stuff. And the reason it's just this simple is that the memory for the integer, the attendee count, is inside the conference object, so there's no separate manage memory management issue there. It gets a bit more interesting when we start looking at the objects. So getters for objects, um, they can be as simple as scalar quantities, so again we can just return the pointer that we're storing. Um, sometimes you might make it a bit more complicated to make sure nobody else can change the value here um, once they've got a hold of it, but in general that, that will work. It's the setters that get interesting. So if we just try and use a setter like that, that looks exactly the same as what we did for the, the integer, where we're taking the value passed in and we store that in our, um, our instance variable, we've got two problems from a memory management point of view. One is that we haven't claimed ownership of the new value, so we could go away at any time. And uh, we also haven't done anything to release the old value. So we're left without a reference to it, and our memory could leak. So we don't write object headers like that. So what we do do is something like this. So we put in, in this case where, and there's, there's a few different patterns for this, um, but this is one that that's commonly used and works well, um, where we first up test whether the new value that's been passed in is different from the old value. Because um, if they're the same, we don't need to do anything. It's, it's all, everything's what we want. But if they are different, what we can then do is go ahead and release the one that we already had ownership of and, excuse me, retain the new one and then assign it to the instance variable. So we're, um, we're balancing out our, our claiming of ownership and our renouncing of ownership making sure we renounce the ownership of anything we owned previously. Now, as I say, there's a couple of variations of this, which I won't go into now, but they're all, there's, there's one special case that they all have to think about, which is what if the new value that's been passed in is the same as the old value? And the risk you run then is if you release it before you retain it, it could go away in between. So you just, that's, that's why that complicates these a little bit. That's, that's for instance, one of the functions that the, that if test is performing there. If we didn't have the if, we, we'd be in trouble. Now one other variation that you often see is something like this, um, where, okay, we've got a string being passed in. One of the things about the NS string class is that there's another class called NS mutable string, which is a, a subclass of NS string, and this represents a string whose contents can change. So if you're given a, a string that's actually a mutable string, and you just retain it, and then you go to refer to it later, you might find it's changed. So what you might do instead 
is um, replace the retain there with a copy. And it's still doing the same thing. It's giving you a, a copy that you own, so you're still claiming ownership, um, but it's also protecting you from someone else going and changing the value um, because now you know that it's your copy alone. And also, by saying copy, even if you send it to a mutable object, you get an immutable copy. Okay, so that's sort of a standard set of pattern for a mutable object. Again, let's just have a bit of a think about what happens with nil values here. So again, say that we'd, um, we'd never set our conference name value before. So how's this going to behave? We've got nil where we had conference name, the old value of conference name. So the if test, presuming we're being passed in a non-nil value, that still passes. Um, we can send a release message to nil, that doesn't cause any trouble. And we just copy the new one and, and claim ownership of it. So that's all fine. What happens if we pass a nil value in as the argument? So new conference name is nil. So again, the if test passes. We go ahead, we release the old value. That's OK. And we end up setting our instance variable to nil. So again, that's OK. It's doing what we wanted. Everything behaves nicely. OK? Good. All right, now I'm going to get on to properties. So as we said, properties are a new feature that um, on the Mac anyway, that came in in 10.5, and that also exists on all versions of iOS. And the great thing about properties is that they can save you from writing a lot of this successor method code. Um, so we've seen that there's sort of a, some standard patterns we can follow with these excesses, but they get pretty boring if you've got to write that code out for every one of your instance variables. And up until 10.5 um, on Tiger, I'm oh, sorry, on, on the Mac, that's what we had to do write all those, those methods by hand. Um, straightforward code, but it's boring code. It's, you can make mistakes in it, so it's nice if you can avoid it. Um, the other thing that properties can do if you're running on what's called the modern runtime, which basically on, on current versions means everything except Mac 32-bit, um, properties even save you from having to declare the instance variables. Um, on older platforms, you, you, you can use properties, but you also need to declare the instance variables as well. So this is really nice. So if we look at our header file um, on the latest operating systems, we can make it look like this. Nothing in between the braces, so we skip the instance variable declarations. But again, the reminder that that's only for the modern runtime, so if we're doing 32-bit Mac code, we do still need that. Um, and the, the interesting bit is that now we just declare these things as properties rather than as instance variables. So the properties are indicated by this at property keyword or compiler directive. And then you just follow that again with the type and the, the, um, the name of the property. And we're giving the compiler a bit of extra information with the property as well. Because um, you notice that bit in brackets where we're saying assign or copy. So this is where we're saying how we want the memory management done um, for this, uh, this variable. And so the options we've got there for saying how we want the memory management done, so this is what's called the, the setter semantics because it's about how we want the setters to work. Um, so the default is assign, which is what we saw for our, um, our integer variable before. So where we just take the value that's passed in in the setter and we assign it um, to the instance variable. Then you've got retain, which does the second version, or the first version we saw for the string, where we release the old version and retain the new one. And uh, copy does the last thing we saw for the string where we release the old string and then copy the new one that's passed in. So we get to specify that to the compiler that this is how it's going to work. Now where, um, well one way the properties make our life really easy for us with memory management and with writing accesses is having declared the properties in our .m file, then we just need to synthesize them. So this replaces writing the methods. All you do is say at synthesize and the name of the property and it goes ahead and creates those methods for you without you having to write them. So that's saving you a lot of work. And as we said, on the modern runtime, it's even creating the instance variables for you as well, which is really nice. Now, the, it's important to keep that in mind. So if we're using properties, we still have methods called attendee name, set, sorry, attendee count, uh, set attendee count colon, um, conference name, set conference name colon. 
It's just we didn't have to write them. We've declared them and created them using this syntax. Um, okay. Another thing that's often used with properties but isn't the same thing is what's called dot syntax, which you might have seen. And so again, it came in as part of Objective-C 2.0 in Leopard. So we've got these equivalent ways of calling the getter method. Um, the traditional way at the top there, using the square brackets and the name of the variable. But we've also got this newer syntax here where we can just say conference dot conference name. And although it doesn't look like it, that's actually still calling a method. So keep that in mind. It's, it's, it's doing exactly the same thing, just writing it a different way. And there's also dot syntax for setters. So there's the traditional way at the top, set conference name colon. And now we can write conference dot conference name equals and give it the new value. And again, although it doesn't look like it, it's still calling the same method, set conference name colon. So it's doing exactly the same thing, just writing it a different way. So again, just to emphasize it, dot syntax is calling your getters and setters at runtime, even though it mightn't look like it. Some Cocoa experts really hate dot syntax. Anyone read Aaron Hillegas's book on books on Cocoa programming, the Bid Nerd Ranch books? They don't like it. And they argue that it just makes things obscure, less clear, you can't see what's going on anymore, even though the methods are being called, you're not seeing them being called. So, you know, valid argument. Um, there's an argument in favour of them, which is you get a bit of extra compiler checking when you, when you use the dot syntax and properties together that you miss out on otherwise. The nice thing uh, is you don't have to, you know, you, you, you're free to use or not use dot syntax. Um, properties and dot syntax, you can use them together or separately, pick either one. Okay? All right, well now we're going to get down to trying to sum this all up and bring it together into a sort of checklist of good practice. And this is sort of a, um, a suggested strategy. Um, so some of this is stuff people, you won't find people do all the time, but this is what I recommend as the, uh, the best way of making sure your memory management's good. So the first is, the first is three things about instance variables. One is to make sure that you claim ownership of them in your init method, as we saw earlier on. Second is to make sure you release them in dialloc. And the other bit that's um, optional but I find extremely good practice and strongly recommended, which is everywhere else you have to deal with an instance variable, you always use the accessor methods, even in your own class. Don't deal with the instance variable directly. And we'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. Now the other variables you're dealing with, will, will 99 times out of 100, will be local variables within your methods. So with those variables, memory management is simple. You claim and renounce ownership in the same scope. You've got to balance claiming and ownership and releasing ownership. You have to do it all within the scope where that variable is used. And the last point on the checklist is to avoid retained cycles. So avoid two uh, objects owning each other. So I've already spoken about init and dialloc and cycles, so I won't say any more about those. But I will say a bit more about using accessors everywhere except init and dialloc. So here's an example of a method that we might have in our class. It's not init or dialloc or an accessor method. Um, and we're changing the value of the conference name instance variable in there. So you could do this, and you'll, you know, you'll see this in Apple's sample code, and it's, it's a valid thing to do. Um, releasing the instance variable and then setting it to a new value that you retain. You're following the rules for memory management, that's okay, but what you're doing is doubling up in code. You've already written a perfectly good setter method that does this. So why write the same logic twice and ask for trouble? So strongly advise, don't do it that way. Instead, just use the setter method. So again, you know, we know the setter method's incorporating the retains and releases for us. We don't have to think about memory management anymore once we've done it correctly in our setter method. And it also means we don't have to think about, oh, did we copy this one or retain it or what? That's all taken care of for us by the, uh, the method. And of course, if we're using properties and at synthesize, we didn't even have to write that setter method. It's, it's all done automatically for us. And um, dot syntax is just as good from a memory management point of view. So if you write something like that, self.conference name equals, 
Again, you're calling the setter method. You've taken care of your memory management. That's all good. Now one objection people often have to doing it this way, to always calling accessor methods, is they feel that, well one, it's tedious writing them, properties take care of most of that, um, but also that they don't want to make that part of their public interface for their class. You know, these are variables that are really for my private use. I don't want to go um, declaring accessor methods for them in my header file. And there's a nice feature um, called class extensions that actually take care of that objection for us. So with class extensions, um, we can declare properties and, ex and thereby declare accessor methods, um, but not put them in our public header file. And this is a, again a newish feature. I'm pretty sure it came in as part of um, Leopard 10.5, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Anyone know for sure? No? Okay, let's, let's say it's part of Objective C 2.0. I'm pretty sure of that. So, what that would look like is um, so we want to declare, say we've got this property private string um, that we don't want to put in our header file but we do want to uh, have accessor methods for it for memory management. So within our .m file, notice it's .m and not .h, so we're not advertising it publicly, um, we've got a section, an, an at interface section. Looks a lot like what we used to declare the class in the first place, but instead of saying at interface conference colon ns object, so it's declaring the class for the first time, we just have the class name conference followed by a pair of brackets, an empty pair of brackets. And so what this is doing is a place where we can declare new methods that are part of this class that aren't advertised publicly in its header file. And that can include property declarations like the one we've got here. Okay, So we can declare properties um, but not make them public in that right regard. Uh, Objective-C is a very dynamic language and at runtime if somebody really wanted to call these methods they could. Um, but the point is we've made our intention clear that they're, they're meant for our internal use, not for public use. Now um, I'm, I'm recommending using accessor methods everywhere, or nearly everywhere, um, for modifying your instance variables. One place I'm not recommending them is your init method. And you might ask, well, why not? Why not, uh, in the init method, just do things like this, self.conference name equals new conference name. Call the setter method, it's taking care of the memory management for us, we don't have to think about it. And uh, certainly a lot of good Cocoa writers over time have recommended that approach. Um, but more recently people have got a bit wary of it um, because there's a, there's a danger there which is that you're actually calling into a method there, um, that setter method. And um, people sometimes make setter methods a bit more complicated than just changing one instance variable. They might want to make sure that the, um, the class maintains a consistent internal state. So they might modify other variables as well or query the values of other variables. Um, in an init method, we're dealing with an object that isn't fully created yet. It's still in the process of getting created. And so you can't make assumptions about what the other instance variables are set to. Um, so that for that reason, it's safer not to call uh, the setter method. It's safer just to manipulate the instance variable directly. Um, the other big danger is you might think, oh well I'm always going to write nice straightforward set of methods, I'm not going to do complicated stuff that changes other values or looks at other values. Someone could subclass your class and change the definition of that set of method. So when you're in, you write the init method, you think it's calling your setter but actually it's calling someone's setter that they've overridden. So the safer way to write your init methods is just to stick with straight out manual memory management writing the retains or whatever yourself. Okay? And the same argument goes for dialloc methods. So you could use the setter set something equal to nil in your dialloc, but it's safer just to release the instance variable directly. Okay, um, what about other variables? So here's an example of um, a method where we've got a local variable called new name of type ns string. And we're allocking it at some stage, so we're claiming ownership of it. So in this case, we need to, if we claim ownership, we have to renounce ownership in the same scope. So within a, if you find an alloc in any of your methods, um, make sure you've got a release to, to balance it, unless it's an init method. 
Now, uh, this is also where we haven't talked much about the difference between release and auto-release so far, and I'm not going to dwell on that. But um, this is really your use case for auto-release, which is when you've got a, a method of your own that's returning an object that you want to give to someone else to use. So you might be creating a string in here. Um, you create it with alloc, and then you want to provide it to another object, return it. So this is the case when you use auto-release. Because what you're saying is, this object needs to be released. I'm, renounce, I'm going to renounce ownership of this, but I don't want it to happen straight away. I want to give a bit of time, a bit of a delay, so that anyone else can claim ownership of it who wants to before it's released. So again, we're fulfilling our responsibilities. We're balancing a claim of ownership with a releasing of ownership. But we're giving that opportunity for someone else to claim it if they want to. OK? Does that give you a bit of a guide you can follow, do you think, in your own code? Good. So now this is the fun part of the talk, where we talk about bad practice, um, or what I've called um, malodorous memory management. So everyone's heard of the idea of code smells. Code smells is the idea of sort of like you've got design patterns, which are good things to do in code, patterns that you want to repeat. Um, code smells or anti-patterns, and when you look at a bit of code and you think, oh, that doesn't, that's, there's something going wrong there. So I'm just going to talk about some. They're not necessarily things that are done wrong, but they're things that make you look and think twice. So these are, I want to point out some things for you to, when you see these in your own or other people's code, look and think twice, am I doing my memory management right? And the first one is manipulating instance variables directly. So we said, yes, in init and dialloc we have to do that. If we're writing our own accessor methods, we have to do that. Um, but anywhere else, if you're working with your instance variables directly as opposed to going through accessor methods, Ask yourself why, because it's just inviting memory management bugs when you find yourself doing that. Another smell is if you see retain statements in your code anywhere except in an accessor method or in it. Um, so the reason being that if you're using your accessors, that should be taking care of retaining anything that you need to. So why are you needing to, um, to retain anything extra? This one's not a code smell, this is a definite wrongy. <laughs> if you um, are calling dialloc anywhere in your code, you're doing something wrong. The one exception being when you're overriding dialloc and calling the superclass version. Okay? So if you find yourself calling dialloc, you've done something wrong. Another biggie is this one. Um, testing the object first before you decide whether to release it. So the rule is, if you own it, you release it. If you don't own it, you don't release it. Why are you testing it? You don't find out. You know whether you own it or not. You shouldn't have to ask it uh, whether you own it. And the one that's closely related to that, as we'll see in a moment, is the retain count method. Um, and I've deliberately left out any talk which, of things you've probably heard about before, retain count and reference count, um, which is sort of the internal implementation detail of how um, Coco keeps track of how many um, owners an object has. And it is important to treat that as an implementation detail, because if you start calling this method retain count, asking an object how many owners it's got, and making decisions about whether to release it on that basis, things are going to go wrong. The only thing you have to worry about is do I own it or not, not who else owns it. And um, some programmers have been so annoyed by retain count and the stupid things that programmers do with it that they've actually filed a bug with Apple to remove that method from the frameworks altogether. Um, and there's this nice quote in there. So you can see um, it's a source of endless confusion among developers new to the environment and usually leads to vomit-worthy code like this. So you can see that's doing exactly what I spoke about there. It's asking the object first for something about it and then deciding whether to release it. And in fact, what that's doing is throwing away all the owners of the object, not caring who else might own the object, but just saying, I want to get rid of you from memory. Okay, so that's what not to do. Okay, so the summary really just means repeating two slides. The strategy there, so this is the checklist I suggest you follow. Um, manage your instance variables this way, using your accessor methods everywhere except in init and dialloc. Um, your other variables, manage them within the scope where they're used, and avoid uh, cycles. And there are valid cases when you might need to depart from this. Um, the bottom line all the time is the rule that we framed earlier. 
So do you own the object? Then you're responsible for releasing it. If you don't own it, you're not responsible. It's all summed up in that one slide. OK, that's it. Any questions? So, okay, presumably something would own it, otherwise it wouldn't exist. So, yeah, it would, that was just showing the relationship between those two objects. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it wouldn't, if, if nothing owns it at all, it won't exist. But, yeah, something would have to create it and own it. But what you wouldn't want to make sure is that two objects don't own each other, because then you can never get rid of them from memory. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. Yeah, it's not, not really multiple hierarchy, or it's not, not multiple inheritance in an object-oriented sense, because you, you talk about multiple inheritance when a subclass can have several parent classes. Here we're talking about object instances, um, and you know, who's owning them and create, create, keeping them in memory, not, not saying anything about what methods or data they inherit from their parent class. So quite a different concept from inheritance. Uh, yeah, if, if you're writing code that's likely to be used in a 32-bit environment, yes, by all means. And also, even on Snow Leopard, um, until recently there were bugs if you didn't. So certainly if you wanted to work with the instance variables directly, uh, you weren't able to get at them until recently unless you declared them. So, so if you're doing code that's got to be backward compatible in any way, then there are arguments for that, yeah. Well, backward yeah. compatible doesn't make sense. Uh, hmm. The operating system... I think it runs a 32-bit kernel by default. Um, yeah, I don't know. If you're writing operating system code, that's got to fit in there. But usually you can write 64-bit apps and run them on Snow Leopard, all right? Okay, then you've got to write it 32-bit, yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's a fairly new thing being able to do without the instance variables. Yep. Yeah, so if you want to be safe, put them in anyway. It just means you've got to put the same thing in two places, and I really hate that. <laughs> okay. Any more? Everyone feels they can be really expert memory managers now? <laughs> Good. Did that answer some of the concerns you had or meet some of what you wanted to get from the talk? Good. Okay. Thank you.